Hello, lads. Welcome. Homeschooling number 24 with your uh, host, Little Tommy. Special super early morning edition. I just woke up, man. And we got to do some stuff in a little while, so I figured I'd just do one real quick and uh, reconnect with the homeschooling family. You know, um, I was just saying to Sarah, the difference between waking up on your own volition in the morning and being woken up by some outside forces such as your kids. Wow, what a difference. I mean, I feel like a brand new woman. Just actually laid there sleeping until it was time for me to decide to get up. Man, it makes all the difference. I know you guys can relate, you guys with kids. You know, I got out in the world yesterday. I can't believe it. I actually got out, I didn't do a session. As a matter of fact, I canceled that that one session that I was telling you guys about because Sarah was freaking out about it so bad. Uh, I have one booked for the 21st, but she's trying to talk me out of that too. She really, she wants me to stay home for one more month and I think I'll go crazy if I do. Sweet mother, sweet Lord. But then I got out in the world yesterday. I went down to Groons to see my, uh, they're not really open, but my dear friend Greg, who, who runs the repair, uh, repair department up there, was, was working. Uh, I had to drop off a guitar, pick up a guitar. So there was a couple uh, Groons employees hanging around, and we all stood around with masks upstairs on the third floor and talked for a while. And it was so great to just be around people that I'm not related to for a minute. We had a nice, nice day, and it was uh, cool to see those guys. Good people up there at the Groons. Uh, so, you know, that song I was just playing. Remember uh, that old Beatles thing? What a great ending, right? G minor. F6. G minor. And then D over F sharp. I think they call that a Picardy third. When you take a minor song and resolve it on a major. Although, I'm not totally sure that's an exact Picardy third. I think a uh, like if a song was all in the key of E minor. And at the very end, we played a big old E major on the last chord. That's called a Picardy third. I think that's right. Check me on that. Music theory freaks. I remember one time, uh, speaking of great endings, I, I just thought this was hilarious. I was thinking about this last night. I don't even know why I was thinking about this, but uh, years ago, I, I was out in L.A. one time hanging around with this, with my friend, old Johnny Z. You guys know John John Ziegler, amazing guitar player? I haven't seen him in ages. I wanted to get, uh, give him a little hello there. Hope you're doing good, Bo. I, I, I haven't seen you in so long. He said he watches these shows. I, I think he wrote something to me. But um, we went to the baked potato one night. This is a long time ago. God, I have no idea how many years ago this was. Went to the baked potato to see some band. I can't remember who it was, but they were playing some pretty rollicking, um, you know, sort of, you know, R&B horns and shit like that, you know. And Johnny knew some of the guys. So on their break, we went back, there's like a little back patio area where the musicians go at the baked potato on breaks, you know, and um, smoke their jazz cigarettes. And, uh, which I don't do. I'm not a jazz cigarette guy. I've talked about that in many, in many episodes. <laughs> I'm not, I, I don't care if you do. You go ahead, kids. I just can't. Um, but not you, Truman Eltringham. And Conrad Govert. Um, no, just kidding. Uh, so yeah, we went we went back there and uh, hung out with these guys for a minute. And Johnny introduced me to the uh, one of the guys that was playing horn. I can't remember what, what instrument he was playing, but but uh, he goes, "Hey man, this is my friend Tom from from Nashville. He's a Nashville session guy." And the guy was you know real cool guy. He goes, "Hey man, what's up?" He goes, "Ah, I'm Nashville cat, man." He goes, "I love you, Nashville cats." He goes, "You go, you guys really know how to end a phrase." I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> the hell does that mean? You guys really know how to end a phrase. You know, it's funny when I when I started thinking about what he meant by that. 
it's true, you know, in country music and in, uh, you know, bluegrass music and stuff, like the dismount of a lick or of a solo is very important, you know. Um, like, you know, like in rock and roll, it ain't like that. Like one of my favorite guitar solos is, is uh, Shooting Star, Bad Company. You, remember, you guys know that one? And the thing is, it's a great example of how a rock and roll solo doesn't have a great dismount. I mean, it starts out amazing. Uh, and then it kind of like just peters off into this weird sort of no man's land ending. But it, but it's still a great solo, you know, because it's got the great tone and it's got it's got the, you know, the, the attitude. But in, in country music, bluegrass music, you can't get away with that shit. You gotta like have a strong dismount, you know, at the end of a solo. Like if you're gonna, if you're gonna play some crazy shit, you gotta have a real strong exit. You know what I mean? He picked up on that. He's a jazz cat, you know. I just thought that was hilarious. That's pretty funny. I thought. Um, here's a question. The guy said, "Hey, hey Tom, watch your rig, rig, rig rundown. Why do you have such a big pedal board?" Um. Look, I have many pedal boards, man. I have uh, that one in that rig rundown is my main cartridge session board. And yeah, that, that thing is huge. But there's a reason for that. I'll tell you that in a minute. But most of my pedal boards are pretty small, you know. They don't have to be elaborate. But, you know, when you're a session man, there's things, there's 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 instances where, like, you have to come up with a lot of sounds that aren't, that don't sound like guitars. You know what I mean? Um, there's certain forms of music that you're playing sometimes where they don't want traditional guitar sounds, like a guitar plugged into an amp. I remember back in the day, I used to do a lot of uh, CCM sessions, you know? I haven't done one in a long time because they eventually got tired of my foul mouth and my heavy drinking. But I enjoyed doing those sessions, you know, back in the days, great uh, people I used to work with back in those days. But I don't know if they still do this, but the CCM world, there used to be, uh, they used to like just load up the tracks with, they like to put like a million parts on every song. It was, it was crazy. I mean, and they didn't want anything that sounded like a guitar. You had to come up with all these synth parts and trippy, you know, ambient atmosphere parts. I remember this one time, I'll never forget this, one of my I have this engineer friend who's absolutely hilarious. He, I know he watches the show. Dear Joe Baldridge, just an absolutely genius engineer and hilarious human being. He teaches at Belmont now, teaches all the other kids how to uh, engineer records. But this is many years ago. And we, and we and back when I had my own studio in my house, you know, we, uh, we were doing uh, this CCM producer wanted me to... Uh, uh, do some overdubs on a, on a song. So Joe was engineering and I was playing and this guy was producing. So he comes over with his tracks and he, and, uh, <clears throat> he plays the song, you know, Joe plays it for us on a Pro Tools rig. And the guy looks at me, he goes, what do you think? And I, and I go, it sounds like a finished record already. It sounds great. He says, oh, no, no, no. We need, we need to put a, a bunch of guitars on there. And I was like, really? It sounds pretty awesome. Like it, like it is, you know, uh, why do you need to add a bunch more stuff? He goes, no, no, I got a bunch of ideas, guitars I want to do on there. I was like, okay, cool. So I'm always less is more guy. I mean, I would rather put one meaningful track on a song than 10 sort of whatever tracks. Um, but anyway, the guy, the guy, want, you know, we, we worked for hours and hours and hours and hours and uh, adding all these guitars. He had all these ideas and we put the stuff on us. Okay, now I'm picturing this and now I'm picturing that. So I finally, like hours later, man, this thing was chock full of guitars. And uh, poor Joe was just sitting there staring at the Pro Tools screen with his head spinning. There was so much going on in the track, you know. And then, and then the guy goes, hey, he, the producer goes, I got one more idea. And I was like, really? I go, oh, all right. So he, he, he wanted to try one more thing. So I tried this one last part and there's already like a million guitars on this thing. And uh, we got done with it, and he looked at me, and he, he goes, what do you think? 
And I go, I, I go, I don't know, man. And then he looks at Joe, the, the engineer, and he goes, what do you think, Joe? You like that? And Joe goes, I feel like I just got home from work and all my kids are trying to tell me what they did today all at once. <laughs> I don't think I've ever laughed that hard in my life. I'll never forget that moment. The Goose, Joe Balders, I love you, buddy. That was funny. Oh, my God. Okay, so, uh, yeah, this guitar, you know, I, I talked about it in the... Um, I'm going to solve the big mystery of the Leon. I talked about it in the rig rundown. This is my only good acoustic. And um, uh, I said in the rig, rig rundown, I think it might have belonged to Leon because I'm a case back there, hand stenciled on the case. It's big letters that just says Leon. Old. You could tell it's been on there forever. This is a 38, right? So I was saying to Bollinger, I said, so, you know, you think it was his? And Bowen's just like, I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it was. Then everyone's trying to speculate what Leon I was talking about. But I was talking about Leon Russell. Because I think this might have been his guitar. I have no proof. But what other Leon would just write Leon on the case? I met Leon Rhodes a time or two. He didn't seem like the kind of guy who would just write Leon on a case. Nice guy, though. So, yeah, there, there you go. Uh, I didn't... I didn't do a, I hope you guys don't mind. I, I, I don't know if I could do one of these every day. I didn't do one yesterday. I wasn't in the mood. I don't want to force it either. The homeschooling has got to be natural. When you're not in the mood, you can't, you can't fake it. And uh, one last thing I was going to talk about uh, in closing. Um, you know, depending on what you want to get out of the guitar, I'm sure a lot of people out there watching this are just beginners who just want to goof around as a hobby. And that's totally cool. I love that. If it brings you enjoyment to sit around and play guitar, you know, just goof around, that's great. I always ask people when they, when they tell me they want to learn guitar, like, what do you want to get out of it? And uh, if, you're, if the answer to that question is to just have a little enjoyment and fun, then that's great. That's you just go for it, and you just if it brings you joy to sit around and plunk some cowboy chords or whatever, man, it's fucking awesome. But I'm talking, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a special shout out to the guys out there who want to be like real players, right? Like real players that want to be as as good as anyone. Like when you're when you're thinking about your playing, I've been thinking about this lately. This is what I've always done, okay. People say like, "Why do you? Why are you so hard on yourself, dude?" You know, because you, you know me. I, if you've watched any of my videos, you know that I'm extremely hard on myself. I never feel like anything I'm playing is good enough. Um, I work my ass off because what's going on in my head is what I've always done in my whole life is compare myself to the greats. Right? I was never happy being as good as another Nashville session guy that I was in competition with or something like that. Not that those guys aren't great or any of that. It's just that my barometer of what I'm trying to attain has always been the greats, my gods of guitar, you know? And I'm never gonna be happy until I get anywhere near any one of those guys and I feel like I still got a long way to go. But I, I think as torturous as that is and self-loathing, is that is, it's the only way, if you wanna play for real, if you wanna be great, you have to compare yourself, not to your neighbors, not to your friends, to the greats. I mean, that is it. I mean, there's nothing, there, you're never gonna get anywhere just trying to be as good as your buddy across the street or something like that, okay? It's just just a little something to think about. Um, you know, people say, uh, I think people are like, why are you bust yourself so bad, Tom? And why are you always saying, you know, you can barely play acoustic and all that stuff? It's like, well, look, I've been around real acoustic players, like Brian Sutton, my buddy. I can't play acoustic like him. So so why would I sit here and tell you that I'm a great acoustic player? You know what I mean? It's like, it's just, uh, but I, you know, I do what I do and I'm, and I'm trying to get there. And we all are trying to get there. And uh, just a little advice there from Uncle Larry. 
don't just keep up with the Joneses. Keep up with the Dave Gilmore's. Or Jimi Hendrix's or whoever you idolize, you know? All right, lads. Have a great day. I'll see you soon.